Hi and thank you for watching. Before I continue I would like to say that this video is probably the one that has excited me the most. Especially when we consider the events currently transpiring in the world, the times that we live in and when we consider what is about to happen. If you are weary and tired of waiting for what our Heavenly Father had promised us in His Word, then the information contained in this video will surely lift you up and encourage you as our Bridegroom is about to open the door to His Bride. Having said that, with the information I will be sharing with you today, I also wanted to update this timeline that I shared with you in earlier videos, when we lacked the understanding that we now have, and also to share some of the revelations that our Heavenly Father shared with me over the past few weeks. Firstly, we know that God's Word is the truth, and that we can be sure to believe what our Heavenly Father has shared with us in His Word, it will certainly come to pass just as He said. The only fallible aspect is our interpretation and understanding of God's Word. When it comes to the day counts provided in Daniel 12, these are very specific and my question to our Heavenly Father over the past few weeks was this. Is our understanding of the decree that was issued by the WHO on March 11, 2020, in which a global pandemic was declared through which normal daily life was ended, a proper application of what was written in Daniel 12 verse 11? Or should we look for a different application? And from the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away, and the abomination that maketh desolate set up, there shall be a thousand two hundred and ninety days. Blessed is he that waiteth, and cometh to the thousand three hundred and five and thirty days. What immediately came to mind when I asked our Heavenly Father about this was the Fukushima nuclear disaster, and he said I should look at the symbolism that he provided in this regard, serving as a warning of what would happen to humanity in the future. The Fukushima nuclear disaster occurred on March 11, 2011, which just happened to be the exact same date exactly nine years before the declaration by the WHO made on March 11, 2020. So what happened during the Fukushima nuclear disaster and how did this serve as a warning to humanity? On March 11, 2011, a massive magnitude 9.0 earthquake occurred off the coast of Japan that resulted in a massive tsunami that flooded the Daiichi nuclear power station. Once the power station was flooded, the pump supplying cooling water to the fuel rods could no longer cool the fuel and this resulted in the worst nuclear accident the world has seen when nuclear meltdowns occurred in three units of the power station. Since this accident, which occurred on a very interesting and notable date, the world's oceans have been exposed to a contaminant that has brought about irreversible damage and causing the oceans of the world to become empty and void of sea life. So in what sense was this disaster a warning to us? In Revelation 17, we read about God's judgment over the earth, and in this chapter, the angel that was sharing the information with John specifically pointed out that when God begins to judge the world, the waters are representative of the people of the world. And there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. And he saith unto me, The waters which thou sawest where the whore sitteth, are peoples, and multitudes, and nations, and tongues. When we look at the Fukushima nuclear disaster in light of the interpretation provided in God's Word, through the explained symbolism and how this pointed to what would happen to the people of the world exactly nine years later, there can really be no doubt about the fact that March 11, 2020, was indeed the date marked by a decree that affected the entire world and which brought about an end to normal daily life. This was followed by the release of a substance that the Bible refers to as an abomination that causes emptiness. And just as the release of radioactive material into the oceans continues to cause irreversible damage bringing about waters with no life in them, so too is this substance that was introduced into the human population shortly after March 11, 2020, bringing about spiritual emptiness in those who were deceived by the enemy. What happened to the people of the world since March 11, 2020 would seem to be a repeat of what was shown to us nine years earlier, and given that both events are associated with a March 11th date, confirms that this is a very specific pattern that our Heavenly Father provided for our understanding. 
Have you ever thought about the Fukushima nuclear disaster in this way? Is it not amazing how our Heavenly Father uses repeating patterns to confirm His word to us? For those who were affected by this abomination, do not lose hope, because God's word also promises that those who were affected will eventually be restored. Then I heard one saint speaking, and another saint said unto the certain saint which spake, How long shall be the vision concerning the daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot? And he said unto me, Unto two thousand and three hundred days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Having received confirmation of the March 11th date, and that it marked the beginning of a period that Daniel 12 verse 11 points to, we can also be sure that God will keep His word with regards to the day counts provided in this passage. As explained in a previous video, we know that there are two instances in which Gabriel shared a patterned prophecy with Daniel through which the arrival of the Messiah could easily be calculated by those who considered the two prophecies. The first is found in Daniel 9 verse 25 and the second is of course found in Daniel 12 verse 11 and 12. I've also shown in previous videos how a delay of 21 days applies to the second instance and we know then that the 1290 day countdown commenced 21 days after March 11th 2020 or April 1st of the same year. Given that Gabriel explained to Daniel that this period would be for the testing and purification of those who will be made white and who will turn many to righteousness, we know what the purpose of the 1290 day period is. This time represents the beginning of God's judgment and this begins with His church. For those who belong to God's church and who refuse to submit to the mandates that were implemented by the powers that be over the past three years, this was their time of tribulation and testing. Would they stay true to God like Daniel's three friends and refuse to bow before a golden statue, not caring whether their choice to refuse could have caused them to be thrown into a fiery furnace, or would they betray the Lord as Peter did, just to avoid persecution? Jesus refers to this time as the beginning of sorrows in Matthew 24, and it precedes the tribulation that will come over the world, when God's judgment will shift from His church to the world. Many shall be purified and made white and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God, and if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of wars, and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences, and earthquakes in divers places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Later in this passage from Matthew, Jesus describes the events that immediately follow the testing of his church, and this is what he says. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory and he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. Now, there are many of God's children who believe that this passage is proof that the rapture occurs after the tribulation that will come over the world, when Jesus returns to make war against the Antichrist and those who follow him. However, when we consider the harvest and temple models, we know that what Jesus describes here is linked to Revelation 14, where Jesus gathers in his harvest 
and that this is part of a three-part process. If God's church is judged first, the church will be the first to experience tribulation, and the events that Jesus described in Matthew 24 tell us that when he refers to the tribulation of those days, he is referring to the tribulation that will come over his church right before the time of harvest, where Jesus will separate between the owner's portion and the corners of the harvest that are left to the poor and the stranger. And I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and upon the cloud one sat like unto the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, Thrust in thy sickle and reap, for the time is come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. And he that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. Both of these passages tell us how Jesus is applying the requirements specified and forming part of his harvest model that are clearly described in Leviticus 23. Without understanding how our Heavenly Father expects a harvest to be conducted, something that Jesus will also fulfill according to these instructions, it is easy to misunderstand what Jesus shared with his disciples in Matthew 24. In addition, Jesus says that immediately after the tribulation of those days, referring to the testing of his church, the sun would be darkened and the moon will not give her light. If we apply this understanding to the 1290 day period that started 21 days after March 11th, 2020, we arrive at October 13th of 2023. Immediately after this day, a very prominent solar eclipse occurred, representing the sun being darkened and the moon not giving her light, just as prophesied by Jesus in Matthew 24. Seven days before this eclipse, the war between Israel and Hamas started, and this is very significant, as I believe this represents the start of Jacob's trouble, where God's attention will once again turn to Israel, who have rejected him, but who will soon call out to him to rescue them from total annihilation. So when we look at Daniel 12 verse 11 and 12 again, having this additional information, we see that the time between the end of the 1290 day period and the 1335th day serves as a transition from God judging his church to once again turning his attention to Israel and the world. Gabriel also told Daniel that those who wait and who come to day 1335 will receive a blessing. What could this blessing be? Given that the rapture has not happened yet, and that this day is fast approaching, it stands to reason that this could be the day on which Jesus reaps his harvest and gathers in those that belong to him. It could be our blessed hope that Paul refers to in Titus 2 verse 13. Looking for that blessed hope, and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ, if my understanding is correct, and as always, I could be wrong, day 1335 will fall on November 27th this year. What if my understanding is incorrect and this day passes uneventfully yet again? Well, then Gabriel did not use a repeating pattern for announcing two instances in which the arrival of the Messiah could be calculated. Then the Fukushima disaster would not have pointed out the star date of a period of time where normal daily life ended for the world, and life in this world would then apparently still be considered normal, even though everyone is continuously asking when life could go back to normal. The solar eclipse that occurred on the day after the 1290 day mark was reached would simply be a coincidence and have no relevance to what Jesus said in Matthew 24 regarding the time that leads up to his second coming. In fact, it would mean that we will have to wait until at least February 2026 for the next instance in which the correct order of eclipses, with the sun being eclipsed before the moon, as described by both Jesus and Joel, would occur again. Can you see the world continuing to deteriorate for another two plus years without our Savior intervening on behalf of those that belong to Him? I certainly cannot see that happening. On the other hand, if my understanding with regard to this time is correct, we know that God's word is truth, and that what he said will surely come to pass, and the last day for which all of what I have mentioned could still remain true would be November 27th. 
If we pass this day without seeing the blessing that was promised in Daniel, then the patterns would be broken and what Jesus and Gabriel shared about this period would no longer fit the signs that were given to confirm this understanding. It is also interesting that predictive programming would also seem to be pointing to this date. Many have asked me why I share information that is considered predictive programming, or where it seems that the enemy has some knowledge concerning future events, and I would like to share some information on this as well. First, I believe the Bible instructs us to expose the plans of the enemy when we become aware of them, and that we place ourselves in a position of advantage when we know what our enemy is planning. In any war, intelligence on everything concerning our enemy would be vital to win. The more we know about him, the better we can prepare to defend ourselves against them, but also on the best way to attack them. Many Christians run onto the battlefield not even concerned about the armor that the word instructs us to put on every day, and believe that they will be victorious against the enemy come what may. If that was truly the case, why would Jesus tell us to watch and not to allow anyone to deceive us? If the enemy is unable to touch us, what role does deception play in this? And why should we avoid it? Think about it. God's word has the following to say about the matter. Lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. From these passages we see that if we are ignorant of the enemy's devices, he gains an advantage over us, and I believe the events that transpired in the world over the past three years prove that point. Many walked into the enemy's trap without even knowing it because they did not think it important to gather intelligence on the enemy. God's word would also seem to indicate that it is our Heavenly Father's will for the enemy to know the future, and that even though the enemy would have all the information required, he would still be unable to do anything about the eventual outcome, or to avoid what is coming. We read about this specifically in Psalm 37. Rest in the Lord, and wait patiently for him. Fret not thyself because of him who prospereth in his way, because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass. Cease from anger, and forsake wrath. Fret not thyself in any wise to do evil. For evildoers shall be cut off, but those that wait upon the Lord, they shall inherit the earth." For yet a little while, and the wicked shall not be. Yea, thou shalt diligently consider his place, and it shall not be. But the meek shall inherit the earth, and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. The wicked plotteth against the just, and gnasheth upon him with his teeth. The Lord shall laugh at him, for he seeth that his day is coming." The wicked have drawn out the sword, and have bent their bow to cast down the poor and needy, and to slay such as be of upright conversation. Their sword shall enter into their own heart, and their bows shall be broken. In verse 13 we see how the Lord laughs at the wicked who sees his day coming. The question now is, how is it possible that the wicked can see his day coming? Think about that. The Lord laughs at them because, even though they plot and plan against the just, their sword and bow will cause their own destruction, and there is nothing that they can do to prevent this. So, by what means do they see this day approaching? Before we tumble down this rabbit hole, I would like to share a clip from a movie titled Paycheck, released in 2003, and I would like you to consider some of the information shared in this movie about future events that would seem to portray exactly what is currently happening in the world. Machine predicts a war. We go to war to avert it. It predicts a plague. We herd all the sick together. Create a plague. Whatever future this predicts, we make happen. We give over control of our lives completely. Seeing the 
If you show someone their future, they have no future. You take away the mystery. You take away hope. In this film, they built a machine with which they can see into the future, and the implication is made that those who have seen the future have no hope and cannot change what they saw. Does this not sound exactly like the message of Psalm 37? Have you ever heard of Project Looking Glass? This is a black ops project that apparently involved technology that was reverse engineered from ancient artifacts that apparently contained alien technology. Now we know that the word alien is simply a secular name for fallen angels and demons, and the technology that they share is far above that which humans are able to come up with. There have been several whistleblowers who have worked on this project and who have shared details on the work that they were involved with, and I will include a link in the description below to a video in which a good summary of this information can be found that will help you to better understand what this is all about. I do not want this video to be too lengthy and you are welcome to do some of your own research into this project. But to give a brief summary of the information they shared. The looking glass device basically allows a user to select a date and a time in the future or the past and the user then have their consciousness transported to the time and place that they selected and they are able to observe what was happening around them. This sounds very similar to the occultic practice of astral projection where a person's soul would leave their body with the assistance of a demon and travel to a different location where they could observe situations or even take over someone else's body. For the looking glass device, time is an additional attribute that has to be factored in, and the user of the device can not only move to selected locations, but can also traverse the future or the past. Based on the testimonies of those who have worked with this device, actions that were performed in the present before 2012 could affect events that occurred in the future. To give a simple example, if someone visited their own house in the future and saw that their dining room had red curtains, they could change those curtains in the present to green and then return to the future instance to see if the fact that they changed the curtains in the present had any effect on the future instance. Now apparently before 2012 actions that were performed in the present affected the outcome in the future. But any attempt to change the outcome of events that occurred after 2012 no longer had any effect on what happened in the future. God's word tells us in Daniel that the Antichrist will seek to change times and laws, and that these would be given into his hand until God's judgment begins. And he shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws, and they shall be given into his hand until a time and times and the dividing of time. The use of the word until in this passage is quite interesting because it means that the Antichrist will have power over time and laws in the time leading up to the tribulation and it is not something that is pointed out at all by those who study eschatology. This understanding does however fit in with what we read in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 where the following is stated. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. The mystery of iniquity that is already at work before the Antichrist is revealed to the world could very well include him meddling with time and laws, and this would explain why things like the Mandela effect began to impact the world around 2009. For those who do not know what this is, it is the phenomenon of remembering something from your past, but finding no evidence in the world today that would support the memory. For instance, I remember my mother explaining to me what a monocle was when I was about 5 or 6 years old. We were playing Monopoly and I asked her about the thing on the Monopoly guy's face. Today, however, there is simply no evidence that he ever used the monocle, but I can clearly remember the picture. There is actually another animated video in which it is clearly shown who is responsible for the Monopoly guy losing his monocle. I will post a link in the description to the video where you can see more of the enemy's predictive programming in this regard, pointing out clearly who it is that is responsible for the Monopoly guy losing his monocle. According to Psalm 37 verse 13, the wicked see their day approaching, and no matter how hard they try or what they do, the outcome is predetermined by our Heavenly Father, where the wicked will bring about their own destruction. So what do we know about the 1335th day as shared by Gabriel in the book of Daniel, which is only a few days away at the time of this video's posting? 
Well, as I have explained before, the very last day that would allow for everything mentioned in God's Word to fit the timeline, patterns and signs provided would be November 27th. If we pass this date without seeing the blessing that was promised in Daniel 12, then we will need to look for a different abomination in the temple of God and that our bodies were clearly not the intended target. However, there are more interesting aspects to consider about this date. The 27th of November will see a full moon and this immediately reminds us of Proverbs 7 verse 20 where the prostitute tells the young man that her husband is on a long journey and would only return with a bag of money when the moon is full. For the good man is not at home, he has gone a long journey. He hath taken a bag of money with him and will come home at the day appointed. I believe the KGV translation is not exactly accurate when it says day appointed as one would then expect the Hebrew word moed to be part of the sentence. Instead, when we consult the Strong's Concordance, we see that the word is used to refer to the moon when it is full, and it is derived from a word that means to cover. This word occurs only twice in the word of God, and in the other instance it is associated with the blowing of a trumpet on a solemn feast day. Blow up the trumpet in the new moon, in the time appointed on the solemn feast day. When we look at Stellarium, we see that when the moon is full on November 27th, it will be covering or eclipsing Pleiades, or God's heavenly symbol representing his seven churches. I think this is very significant, as this would seem to associate the full moon on a solemn feast day with the blowing of a trumpet and the symbol of the seven churches in the heavens being covered by a full moon, giving proper meaning to the word that is used to describe the full moon in Proverbs 7 and Psalm 81. The sun is entering the constellation of Scorpio with Mars representing war that is accompanying it. Venus or the day star is in Virgo and its position reminds one of the following passage. We have also a more sure word of prophecy whereunto ye do well that ye take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. November 27th falls on a Monday, or the second day of the week, and what happened on the second day during the creation week? God separated the waters above from the waters below. We have already seen that God's word describes the waters being a symbol for the nations of the world. In Revelation, we also see that there are two glassy seas. The one is like crystal, and the other is mingled with fire. Once again, two groups matching the harvest and temple models showing us that there will be a group of God's people that will be removed from this world before the start of the fiery trial, and another group that will endure this trial while remaining on the earth. And before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal, and in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. And I saw as it were a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast, and over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, stand on the sea of glass, having the harps of God. Given that November 27th occurs on the day that God separated the waters above from the waters below, this would also fit in with the harvest and temple models, where the owner gathers in that portion of the harvest that belongs to him, while also leaving a portion to the poor and the stranger when he returns to his home. And in the second instance, he will give the outer court of his temple to those who will trample it underfoot. The following passage comes to mind concerning those that are considered his portion of the harvest. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. And whither I go ye know, and the way ye know. Given everything that we know about November 27th this year, and the fact that it marks the last possible day on which 1,335 days could still fit a March 11th, 2020 starting date that applies to Daniel 12 verse 11, let us see what the enemy has shown us in the infamous iPad Go 2 animation. Two scenes that have not come to pass yet are these, the first of which shows markets plunging and stealth bombers destroying an important landmark. 
I have a suspicion that this landmark involves the prophecy in Isaiah 17 concerning Damascus, and that this could mark the time of its destruction and possibly trigger World War III. When it comes to November 27th, and the fact that it is marked by a full moon, is it not interesting that this animation depicts the dead boy rising into the air when a full moon is seen in the sky? This message is conveyed twice in this animation, and given what we now know about November 27th, this would certainly look like the day that these two scenes are pointing to. We also see Pleiades featured in this scene of the animation, which would suggest that it is part of the heavenly signs that we need to keep our eyes on. When the Antichrist steps forward and is introduced to the world, Something that I forgot to mention earlier is that there is apparently a figurine of the White Rabbit from Alice in Wonderland, located in the room where the looking glass device is located. I find it interesting to see that rabbits normally feature in the media where predictive programming is involved. To name a few of these where this is clearly evident, I could mention the films Donnie Darko, Knowing, the series Utopia and of course the iPad Go 2 animation. We are really out of time and you really need to know where you will find yourself when the trumpet is sounded. How do you make sure that you are ready for Jesus when he comes? We have to obtain salvation and how to obtain it is explained in Romans 10. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. This is the first step, and this makes you part of God's faith harvest. Once you are saved, you also have to be baptized, not to add to your salvation, but to allow the Holy Spirit to fill you and to operate through you. Without a baptism, you will not receive any gifts of the Spirit, and as a child of God, it is really important to ensure that you are baptized once you are saved. Baptism serves to equip you and to increase your effectiveness in this world when ministering to others. Then Peter said unto them, Repent, and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Jesus paid an incredible price to save us, and Romans 12 tells us that it is our reasonable service to present our bodies as living sacrifices to God in return. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Could we simply continue in this world to live like the rest of the world once we are saved? It is certainly possible to live that way, but we know that God will separate his harvest into two groups, both of which are saved or have received salvation. If we are living our lives in devotion to him, he will know us as a bridegroom knows his bride-to-be. But if we live as the world, we may hear him tell us that he never knew us, because we were never intimate with him. If our reasonable service to God is to offer our bodies to him as a living sacrifice, how could it be seen as a sacrifice if we continue to live just as the lost would live? So many comment on the videos that I make concerning salvation and that it is important to ensure that one only believes and do absolutely nothing else. It would seem that abstaining from sin to the best of our ability would in their eyes count against us as works that one would do to somehow earn part of one's salvation. This could not be further from the truth. If you are in an intimate relationship with someone, you will know that your actions can affect the other person's feelings that you are intimate with. If you say something to them that hurts them, what would you do if you want to maintain an intimate relationship with them? Would you continue your day as if nothing happened, or would you apologize and try to fix the problem? The same is true for our relationship with our Savior. He hates sin, and if we continue to sin without any care of how that makes him feel, how long will we maintain an intimate relationship with him? He even told us what to do when we sin, and we read about that in 1 John 1. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. 
If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make Him a liar, and His word is not in us. We all sin, but Jesus is coming back for a spotless bride, and only He can cleanse us and ensure that we are without spot or wrinkle when the doors to the marriage are opened. It is up to us to allow Him to cleanse us by following His instructions as indicated. He can only wash us clean of our sins if we confess our sins to Him. It is not a matter of salvation, but a matter of intimacy. And only those who are known by Jesus, those who are intimate with Him, will be allowed into the wedding and will be considered His portion of the harvest. If you want to ensure that you are ready, please watch this video for more information. I hope this video has blessed you and I look forward to seeing all my brothers and sisters in the clouds really soon. I certainly cannot wait and I am really excited to discover what our bridegroom had prepared for us. Until next time or until we meet in the air, God bless. Thank you.